Hey, this week on Locad TV, I'm delighted to say we're joined by Anthony Nardoza. Anthony is the Head of Inventory Solutions at OEM Services and has over 10 years experience in the aerospace industry. Today, we're going to be talking about some of the supply chain uh, challenges that he's faced throughout his career and also his experiences working with Locad's unique take on forecasting. So Anthony, thanks very much for joining us today. Uh, perhaps a nice place to start would be if we could just tell us a bit about your background. Sure, yeah, well, thanks for seeing me. Thanks for the opportunity to discuss this, this topic together. Um, I spent now yeah, almost 20 years in the uh, aerospace industry, uh, starting with aircraft manufacturer Airbus, not to name it, um, doing some flight tests uh, as a logistician, so really around the aircraft, knowing how the life and the daily operation of line maintenance is, um, was very good on the field experience to, to get to know this, this environment. Um, then I turned to serve the customers um, into the customer services department within the headquarters of Airbus, where we were focused on the entry into service of uh, the big super jumbo A380. Uh, then further, having done a few entry into service, I joined the customer side of uh, this industry with uh, a company uh, named Sperliners with a joint venture of Lufthansa and Air France. Uh, doing the support of the A380 and a bit later uh, the Embraer EJET. And now I joined um, say the equipment part, uh, the original equipment manufacturer with OEM services, where I'm now leading uh, the inventory solutions, kind of large subjects, but covering everything touching supply chain and, and inventory topics for this company. Okay, great. And as always, we're joined by Johannes Vermeerau. Um, so Johannes, today we're going to be talking a little bit about the pioneering method you developed for the aerospace industry to do with the forecasting. Um, so what exactly did this method kind of consist of? I mean, first, Anthony has been a big part in, I would say, helping us to um, shape this method, to rethink it. So I think one of the, one of the many insights was to uh, first think, uh, um, I would say, a quantitative modelization that don't betray the business objectives that you're trying to solve. So, uh, which means that um, whatever you want to optimize, you are going to end up with a numerical recipe and you have tons of things that you approximate because um, you see, uh, uh, for example, the, the maintenance of, um, of aircraft is impossibly complex. There is tons of unknowns. Um, you cannot factor in all the variables, even if um, in, I would say, in distant dreams with um, all the sensors we have on board, we'll be able to have a much better view of the, I would say, real time and near future, um, I would say, uh, of, of any aircraft and any of its components. For now, when you do, um, when, you, when, you, when you operate, I would say, an aerospace supply chain, you have tons of unknowns, both in delays, quantities, um, so on. You need to end up with a, a, a numerical recipe that helps you to take certain class of decisions. Um, that can be how many parts do you need to keep in stock at a certain specific location, whether you can actually um, uh, dispose of this part or resell it to a third party at which price, etc. So tons of classes of decision. And whatever is your numerical recipe to assist your decision, you have to make sure that it kind of capture, uh, I would say, the essence of the business so that the, mm -hmm. the numerical recipe doesn't mm -hmm. I would say give you a result that is numerically correct, but business-wise completely wrong. And we started when when we started with uh, uh, with uh, with, uh, with Anthony, we started with basically you know safety stock applied to uh, aerospace, and, uh, and and basically the starting point was where well, it doesn't work. I would say it doesn't work at all. Uh, let's, uh, <laughs> let, let's let's say it. That's a bit strict. But that is strict. I mean, maybe <laughs> for consumable and whatnot, uh, yeah, that yeah. that might work a bit. But for many many situations, it was uh, desperately not not working. And um, and I believe that thanks to you, Anthony, we we uncover some of the key insights that for s for um, for certain players were really driving the business. I mean, in a very obvious way, you want to keep the airplane. Uh, flying all the time as much as you can. That's the purpose of supply chain, <laughs> if you may want to Yes, <laughs> uh, and and how do we do we even translate this kind of insight into uh, I I I I into uh, a process and the numerical recipes that actually support the decision that kind of makes sense? Mm -hmm. And um, and yes, I, I believe that it was thanks to the work of Antonio Ardeza, we were supporting to probably provide a bit of backup in terms of. Uh, 
of implementation and scalability. But, uh, but yes, and, um, uh, and, uh, but, uh, and right now, I think we are, we are moving forward with the descendants of those early insights, which were um, probabilistic forecast and a few other things. Okay, so before we get into the probabilistic <laughs> forecasting sort of side of things, um, you mentioned there sort of safety stock. Uh, what was going on before you sort of were approached by Locad? How were you sort of managing these sort of purchasing decisions? Well, I mean, supply chain and aeronautic does exist <coughs> since a long time and <coughs> was already in place before we did this. Um, it was working, but now the thing is it has changed uh, on the way the market is created. Uh, for a long time, the initial provisioning was the philosophy. Uh, every single company were purchasing their own inventory, creating their own stock, and the effect or the side effect of this cost were kind of marginal in regards to the total cost of managing an airline. And the incentive to optimize the supply chain were not enough to go behind this logic of safety stock, which was in terms of, uh, say, efficiency of support sufficient. Uh, but in terms of cost efficiency, it was completely a nightmare. Um, the fact to have the integration of service providers collecting uh, services from different airlines, or two different airlines, not from uh, two different airlines, and somewhere gathering the responsibility of this um, delivery of service, having this as an external company even more, um, is making this business has to be efficient. Y you have to be business-wise efficient when you do this. And this is the first trigger. And the reason why we moved into this direction to, uh, to have this view of the problem at first. Before, because before so solving it, we need to, to look at it. Um, and so step by step, we, we had to come to the evidence that we could have done better with the money we spent, uh, simply because we can observe that the service level we achieve is not the one we expect. And we do have plenty of material on the shelf which is not moving. That's somewhere the starting point of the reflection. And the question we raised with Locad and we, we tried and we'll say successfully <laughs> answered <laughs> um, is how can I turn my money I invest, my dollar, my euro, my currency I invest in my inventory into the best service level effect? That's the only question we had to ad address. Uh, the difficulty in this kind of exercise is to raise the right question at first. Yeah. So safety stock is somewhere here to cover a certain uncertainty you don't know. A and the idea is how I get educated to all my environment and how can I know the way to use my dollar the best. In that. Let's talk about uh, internally. Uh, what sort of changes did you have to make uh, within your organization to kind of adapt to the, to the kind of low-cut approach that we're talking about? Oh, convince people. <laughs> that's the first thing. That's the first, the first thing. And, and was that easy to do? Uh, as always, at first, no. Yeah. Uh, that, that's the first answer. Um, after you, you convince them because the system, uh, I won't say it's simple, but um, it's logic. A and there is a, a way for what to understand the way it's working. A and sure, it needs time to educate the people or to bring them with the right level of knowledge of, of, of these kind of solutions. Um, and Another issue we have seen is that it gives them more autonomy in the decision. And sometimes they are a bit uncomfortable with it. You know, when before you give one single advice and say stock level, you need to have this, this one, that's it, no question, proceed with it. And somewhere easy because you just blame the calculation, you just blame the person who gave you this advice and, and, and you're fine with your, <laughs> with your own responsibility. But when you get a wise view of the service level, the cost you're going to involve, and the implication of each single decision, and all decisions you can make are highlighted, then people start to be a bit disturbed by this, because uh, then suddenly they are free to take the right decision or to fail. And um, this sometimes creates a bit of uncomfort, and they want to step back to the previous version, saying, oh, no, I don't want to hear about this, take your own decision, and whatever good or bad it is, it's your decision. No, it's not my decision, I give you a full view of the possible future, depending on what decision we're going to take all together. And this, I said, it's a major change. Um, the other one is, for, for some cases, the way we think about the purchasing of components when we do this, or, or the sizing of the inventory, let's say more like this. How do you give priority? Because depending on, on the size of the bucket you create, an aircraft type, um, a full fleet, customer type, um, 
then you're going to optimize differently your, your invest. And then some which are responsible for this part or this part can feel a bit uh, disappointed or uh, more happy because they get more money for it, uh, happier because they get more money. So, yeah, there's all, all these kind of changes which is uh, somewhere important to bring with the solution yeah. along because yeah. and johannes is probably a good point for you to jump in there's so much variability there's so many different problems and so many things we can take into account with these decisions how did you know where to start how do you know which of those problems to even prioritize i mean that that's where you rely on the business insights of the the client i mean it's the good news is it's very rare that you can meet a business that is already working where they don't have those insights because you see it, mm. th the decisions are already being taken every single day somehow even if it's someone who is just saying i believe it's that it means that someone somewhere has a, 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 i would say a knowledge that is of i would say industrial grade the proof being well the company exists and it works and uh, exactly. so so um that's where we are lucky you know uh, and uh, and uh, really the, the insight is is to go more into the um, understanding the business rather than understanding the data at first at first because uh, the data can reflect more the com the complexity of the IT implementation that <laughs> is a bit accidental <laughs> That's right. uh, uh, for example the company is going to use let's say uh, a, a very famous uh, German ERP uh, that is that just happened to support a super large variety of vi verticals uh, and so but your client is not doing fresh food or doing uh, light manufacturing there they are actually servicing aircraft parts so they are using this um, uh, this gigantically capable software but to do a set of things that is like a tiny tiny subset of the whole thing so don't get l so there is like a danger when you if you look just at the raw data um, of just getting lost into looking at things that are completely irrelevant. Mm -hmm. um, also, sometimes you're not even aware of, um, you might even have a concept that is missing, something that you cannot even comprehend because it's something that you do not even imagine. For example, I discovered, I was very ignorant with uh, Anthony, <laughs> you told me about retrofits. And I was thinking, what the hell are those retrofits? <laughs> uh, and if you don't know that, so long story short, for people who have UAS, the idea is that when you, um, when there is uh, in aerospace, ever again, sa safety first. So if an OEM ever has the slightest doubt on a potential security or, or, let's or say to bring improvement as or well, or to bring not to freight people to, uh, to uh, <laughs> any component, I, this because you know. Every single unit that has ever been sold, you uh, have been tracked. Right. You, you can basically say, well, to every single entity who has t taken one of my parts, I'm going to send a new one that is going to replace the old one. And the new one should be mounted because it is superior to the old one for a variety of reasons. But then you have a very specific supply chain pattern where it's, it's a big wave of parts that move through the supply chain, but that is not initiated by the clients, but by the OEMs themselves. So it, it's, it, it's, it's a very, very unusual pattern where it's like a force push from the OEM. And obviously that was the first time for me that I was even seeing that, I was not even expecting that. And when we were starting to see the data, we were seeing what are those incredible spikes of, 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 uh, uh, of part movements that we had. Uh, as, as, as Anthony was working on the uh, on the day of the A380 during the first the very first years, you know, when an aircraft is new, typically you have more retrofits at the very beginning of yeah. the Intrigue life cycle of the uh, of the aircraft, and that was the case for the A380 because the A380 at the time was was still a very very new plane. So that's that's the sort of things where you can I would say fail dramatically if there is something that is like an important concept and you just don't even, you cannot even imagine that. And so obviously just imagine what sort of modelization you can do uh, on top of that if, you, if you're completely missing the point. And uh, let's talk about after you've sort of used the low-cut approach, what's kind of changed from your point of view? What are the key sort of benefits that you've seen? Um, first, the ability to let our stock breathe, uh, which was something a bit difficult to to do before because when you put stock on shelves 
then you just ex expect that one day you're going to serve your customer. Uh, and then here we had the opportunity to take some inventory out, some other in, and for a good reason as well, the consumption is changing with the time. Uh, an aircraft which is new is not having the same needs as an aircraft which is getting a bit older, or very old, and so the need of parts, the shape of the inventory is, is to be different. And if we don't follow the change of the demand, or as well the change of the supply chain behavior, some, some legs are going to be longer, some other ones are going to be shorter with the time, and all of this is changing. So if your inventory stay just fixed with all the same parts on shelf all the time, uh, your service level will just mathematically decrease, or, and then you don't have any control on it, because you expect that things are stable, your inventory is stable, but no. <laughs> your world is changing around you, so your inventory needs to brief and follow this. Yeah. This world changing. Yeah. And how about you, Johannes? What sort of are the key benefits that your clients have sort of seen and uh, sort of told you about since working with Locad? I mean, we had interesting discussion with the CFOs where we were, where apparently I would say that, um, it was profitable significantly, so that's good. But um, what I see, I would say, um, uh, I would say, distancing a, a bit uh, myself a bit from, I would say, the, the 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 immediate profitability, is to gradually shift the the, the teams, the the interest of the teams, more toward um, things that add more value in terms of um, strategic analysis. You see, mm -hmm. as opposed to have to treat your engineers as. Um, you know, as uh, as OPEC, operational expense, where to keep your supply chain operating, you consume X days of manpower every single day. That's, you know, your, um, your, your ongoing operation. You start capitalizing on the work that is being done. You know, it's, it's a very, it's a, it's a transition true. where uh, instead of thinking that you have um, mundane decisions where you need a human to spend a lot of time to generate every single decision, which, because you have a complex supply chain where things are moving all the time, it requires like a lot of manpower all the time. Um, you transition towards something where you have gradually automated this recipe so that people don't have to spend that mm -hmm. much time on that. And so they can do something that has much more added value, which is to change the recipe itself. And, uh, and even to challenge the process for which the, the recipe is still out. So, so sometimes, you know, you, you, you change the process and then the recipe should be changed and overall you have something better. Mm -hmm. um, uh, an example in supply chain would be, okay, yes, you can be super tight in terms of inventory optimization, but actually you are optimizing for certain lead times. And if you manage through different organizations with your suppliers, with your, um, uh, your repair strategy, etc., to reduce your lead time, then you reduce the amount, of, needs, uh, yeah. the amount of, of, of inventory you need. Mm -hmm. um, and there are similar things. And again, the question is that I believe that most of the time we didn't invent those opportunities for improvement. Uh, teams were already aware of them. But the problem was that they were not having initially having the time. And where I was personally uh, very satisfied of, of seeing Locat deployed is seeing that over the year is to see those clients who um, visibly have more time to re think about mm -hmm. those deeper strategic issues and, and to, to really ramp up into some sort of, of work that seems to be more, I would say, of interest, um, even as a, as a human, you know, tackling the same thing. I mean, do you want to do for your entire career where every single day you're going to do the same thing over and over and over? That's, that's typically yeah, the sort yeah, of things um, that <coughs> feels not very fulfilling as, uh, as a human being to, to, do, to do your work. You want to have something where there is a sense of progress, where there is um, some kind of achievement you can capitalize on, this sort of things. So that was, that was probably, I would say, besides uh, just pure immediate, I would say, ROI, that's the sort of things that I've seen where that makes me the proudest. It's not necessarily the biggest, but uh, that's the sort of of improvement we managed to achieve from time to time, mm -hmm. and that was really uh, a big win, I okay. believe. And ultimately, you get more time to dedicate to your customer, because y you spend less time on your own computer alone, on your Excel sheet, <laughs> trying to improve here and there, make calculation again and again, which has no value to the customer, which is interested yeah. in the feedback you can give to him, which kind of uh, good advice you can provide to him, and the way you can explain the way you do it. So this is very important, definitely, the way to, to escape this part of the business from, from the supply chain officer, manager, whoever grade of position he has in the, uh, in the industry. Um, and, and the other aspect which is important is that somewhere the tool is not having any emotion. 
And, and you know, when you remember a part which is causing you troubles again and again and again and again, and maybe things are going better since like six months, nine months, but you know that this one has always creating troubles, you're going to purchase it again, purchase it again. And, and you need more times to come back to reality. It's mm -hmm. this persistence in your image, in your, in your brain that things are, are good here, or maybe they are deviating, or things were bad, so they are still bad. And, and, and this system is allowing us as well to adapt our vision faster or more efficiently to what is actually the reality. Mm -hmm. It's interesting thinking about human attachment to a machine part. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but so the, the, no. the trick is that um, humans, and they, it has even been documented with studies, that humans are, are, are notoriously bad at percepting noise. You see, we see patterns mm -hmm. everywhere. It's, it's, it's very <laughs> difficult not to see a pattern in everything that we see, etc. It's just our brains are, are geared that way. We see patterns. And when you're facing true randomness, it's, it's difficult to, to, to react on it. And when you have this emotional attachment, it's just that you, 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 you're kind of, you see, uh, seeing a pattern, you know, you're mm -hmm. attaching a pattern to something that was just like, uh, just chance, or, or that was at least a big part chance. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Anthony, currently also working as Head of Operations at OEM Services. Um, how have you seen the evolution of that role of a Head of Supply Chain and how do you sort of see it evolving over the, the, the coming future? So, the Head of Supply Chain uh, has definitely changed since already the 20 years I, I, I spent into it. Uh, within the future, this kind of tool will be more here to, to, to support our, our decisions. Uh, and within the aerospace especially, um, I think there will be a lot of changes. It, it's still um, an industry which um, is rather small in terms of volume, in terms of iteration of, of things we do. So it's expensive material, ex aircraft are extremely expensive. Uh, so we don't sell s hundreds or thousands of aircraft, uh, we just sell a few thousands. <laughs> um, <coughs> and, and then it's taking time to, to get into this uh, state-of-the-art supply chain logic, because sometimes it's not relevant, it's too tiny, um, number of events is not recurrent enough. Um, so th there is some changes which will not come to the supply chain, but there are some jumps that will be done, I think. Um, and it's an industry which is moving from the product logic uh, to a service logic. Um, the product where with the IP changing to the pool provider, a and now a bit everything wants to be a rent and they don't want to purchase an asset. Uh, getting an asset is just blocking a value of money that you put on shelf until the day you use it. But what you actually need is a service to have the part available at the time you need it. You don't need the asset itself. A and this industry, it's slowly but surely moving into uh, a widely extension of these services for asset and for a lot of things. So a uh, supply chain will really turn into a, a platform services uh, like any other big ones <laughs> in, in different domains that does exist. Um, and the challenge for supply chain and current companies is to be able to make this change from the product to the services. Nice. And Johannes, how do you sort of see these roles evolving with uh, technology? Um, the way I see that is that I believe that um, more and more uh, it will be a strong engineering competency of, of actually running and optimizing um, supply chain in general, but even more in, in aerospace. Uh, that to some extent, I believe that there are some quantitative skills will be more important. Uh, again, it's also about managing teams. You have you have a lot of things. I mean, leadership yeah. doesn't disappear, etc. <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, I would say I'm. I believe that uh, not being able to um, to start apprehending. You don't necessarily have to do it yourself. You can have, you know, providers, uh, s solution providers and whatnot, you know, that, that supports you. But um, if you can't even start thinking about um, something that would quantitatively modelize your, your objectives, you know, wh what are you trying to achieve? How many AOG incident have you avoided this year for and how much did it cost, etc. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I see that as, as something that will be increasingly, I would say, I increasingly a problem of not having this, uh, this appetite for these sort of things. Plus, also another angle that I see is that um, as, as an effect of this industry transitioning toward services, it means that many companies are, in a way, building some kind of platform, software platform, 
and become service providers, but you know, with a lot of automation involved, which involves software. Mm -hmm. And so um, those companies also, there is, I would say, an angle for the, the quantitative aspect, but there is also an angle for the software aspect. Because much, m I would say, you have the, the mechanical automation that is not necessarily available due to the fact that many things are um, either too large, too small, uh, too diverse, mm -hmm. etc. So you can't necessarily automate automate your warehouse like an e-commerce would do with full robots. You, you, you can partially. I mean, yeah. th this is, um, you can put a very large number of items. Yeah. Like if I remember correctly the number, uh, it's between 60 and 70% of the parts fit in a box like 50 to 40 ah, to 30 so centimeters. Yeah. So mm, there is a way to do it, uh, not yeah. for everything, that's fully correct. Yeah. I mean, an engine won't be taken <laughs> <an> automatic <laughs> harm. We can obviously uh, see this, but um, there is a part that can be done Again, it's a question of volume and concentration of uh, activities to uh, get uh, a certain scale effect that allow you to go into this, uh, but, uh, this yeah, kind yeah. of direction. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, where I see, uh, I would say, uh, a, a potential for significant, uh, I would say, automation is for very mundane clerical tasks. In, in, in a space, especially because you have all this traceability, so there is a lot of operations such as um, having all the, um, uh, the the component maintenance manual, how, how this thing is moving along the parts, etc. There is still a lot of, of situation where I've seen, you know, um, things being printed, scanned, mm -hmm. reprinted, rescanned, mm -hmm. uh, etc. And um, I, and I believe that it will evolve where better software integration so that there is less manual glue in the middle, which means that probably, again, for the, 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 the people that are like supply chain practitioners, they will interact with, in total, more software or probably better design. <laughs> but uh, but I, I see so the appetite for numbers and software will probably grow over the, the coming years, um, even if there are many other qualities that, that will remain present. I mean, capacity to manage a lot of people that are on the ground on many different places, etc., etc., etc. Okay, mm. and a last word maybe for Anthony. <laughs> uh, what sort of technology is there out there that we can see in the future of the aerospace industry? Oh, the, the main one, I mean, it's not a surprise, uh, is the predictive maintenance. It is something which, within the last few years, uh, is really coming a buzzword into the aeronautic industry. Um, everybody is on the starting line on this uh, on, on this approach. I would say it's a must have for the future of, of the supply chain. Uh, for a simple reason is that it will help a lot to improve uh, all the areas. The customer, the way he is doing his operations, because he get to know which one part going to fail at which time with more or less good estimations. Um, the OEMs, because um, they will be able to prepare their shop to receive some parts. They will be able to read better the way the part failed on the aircraft to give better improvements to, to their own components. Um, <coughs> so all of this will somewhat change the nature completely of the supply chain of the aeronautics. Um, the location of the inventory, the way you manage it, all of this will, will, will become a bit different because we're going to have a view of something we had no idea before. Uh, and the new generation of aircraft will deliver tons of data uh, that will give us the ability to somewhere drive better this at this point. Um, nonetheless, it doesn't remove the need to evaluate and to estimate your stock level or inventory level that we addressed at the beginning of our talk. Um, because this is different period or, or time lapse we are looking at. Uh, the investment on parts is mid and long term decisions. Uh, the predictive maintenance is for say from a few hours until maybe one or 200 cycles. Um, so it's completely different scales we're talking about. Um, sure, one will feed the other, um, but the predictive maintenance will be here to locate at the last minute or say closer to the needs location exactly of the part and to settle correctly supply chain. And the optimization of the inventory will be here to size the pipe in which you're gonna, you're gonna work. So say this will be the future of supply chain and for sure it will bring some needs of change of skills in, in terms of, of people doing it. Uh, they will need to be experts, or at least to know how to talk to experts in terms of engineering of the components, to be a domain expert of supply chain, and to have some skills to how to talk uh, to a data scientist, which is handling these tons of data. So all those people need to be able to work and to talk together. So we don't ask to look for a unicorn, which will be able to do all of three, but we need to have people working in those two, two dimensions or three, three groups. Yeah. Okay. 
Great. Well, I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap it up there. But Anthony, <laughs> thanks very much for coming in to visit us. And Janice, thanks for your time. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks very much for uh, watching. And uh, we'll see you again next time. Bye-bye.